Welcome to St. Alphonsus Wellcast, the podcast where we explore the many facets of health and well-being. This podcast is brought to you by St. Alphonsus Corporate Health and Well-Being and a generous grant from the St. Alphonsus Foundation. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. and welcome to the St. Alphonsus Wellcast. My name is Amy James. I'm a registered dietitian in the Corporate Health and Wellbeing Department. And today we are joined by Gabby Bupar, another registered dietitian. Hello. And of course, we have the always amazing Candy Zapia. Hello again. All right. So a few episodes ago, we talked a little bit about some fad diets, three specific ones, uh, that are getting a lot of buzz in the health and wellness world. And so one of them was intermittent fasting. Um, And you probably could have told if you listen to that episode, that we got kind of excited at that one, and it took a lot of time. Uh, So thanks to our curious minds and some of the feedback we got, we're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive into intermittent fasting and hopefully answer some questions um, and help you decide ultimately if this is something that you'd like to try for your own self. Uh, Just as a disclaimer, we strongly advise that no matter what you hear in this podcast, no matter how informational it is and how amazing it sounds, or, you know, on the opposite end, doesn't sound amazing at all. Um, <laughs> if you feel so, you know, moved, if you feel so strongly to, to try this out on your own, um, no matter what your current health status is, before you make any drastic lifestyle changes, please, please, please speak with your provider, speak with your dietitian, and make sure that this is safe or reasonable for, for you. Um, we're going to go into a little bit about, you know, those categories of people that, you know, this might not work out for, but, you know, we don't know exactly who's listening to this and we don't want to dole out information to everybody. Um, Another reason we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, So please just, you know, talk to your provider, talk to your healthcare providers and see if this is a good fit for you before you make any drastic lifestyle changes. All right, so let's get into it. So I think a good place to start here is to just talk about how Gabby and I as registered dietitians, nutrition professionals, feel generally about diets. I mean, we can kind of get into like the term diets, dieting, um, what are the benefits, what are the caveats, pitfalls, et cetera. And so Gabby, I'll turn it over to you and you can, you can. Yeah. So for me personally, I think that diets and like dieting tends to be pretty restrictive for people and it's really difficult to maintain long term. So that's why I typically, you know, don't recommend any specific restrictive diet. And they often don't emphasize, um, healthful eating or they don't teach us how to eat healthfully. Additionally, um, I'll add that most diets do tend to, you know, have some grains of truth to them. Like they typically start from some research or some use medically and then they kind of like snowball out of control and then people are (laughs) utilizing them in ways that maybe aren't the most um, beneficial for them. Definitely. That's kind of my take there. What about you? So I'll tell you this. When I first became a registered dietitian, I mean, even before that, when I was in school, I really had a complex about fad diets, right? I was like, no, I am against it, <laughs> like vehemently. Um, and now that I've had some years to work and practice, talk with more people, um, I've come to realize exactly the same thing, that there are grains of truth with everything. And, you know, we could sit here and, you know, bust fad diets and kind of knock them down and say all the negatives about them. But... If anything, I think that this information gives people resources, gives them options, you know, kind of enlightens people as to different things that they could do, trial up. That's particularly why I enjoy intermittent fasting because there are so many reasons and ways you could do it, and that we'll get into a little bit later. Um, But ultimately, you know, diets in and of themselves are not a one-size-fits-all magic potion to solve everyone's problems. Um, Individualized therapies are still number one. So that's why I'm always going to say in all of these episodes where we talk about diet so heavily Mm -hmm. to see a professional particularly a nutrition professional, a registered dietitian, exercise physiologist, something like that. Um, But that's not to say that these diets don't contain validity or Mm -hmm. aren't substantial or robust enough to potentially help you. And so it's good to keep an open mind, um, but definitely not something that we ever want to go seeking for, like a one-size-fits-all magic pill kind of situation, you Mm -hmm. know. Um, And I just think it's important to, Mm -hmm. to, to... Start there. Um, but let's let's get into the to the meat and potatoes, so to speak, of this episode. Um, Gabby, why don't you tell us exactly what the heck intermittent fasting is? We, yes. We've heard it named a bunch of things. Um, you know, timed, uh, time, to re- uh, time restricted feeding, mm-hmm. intermittent fasting, alternate day fasting, just so many things. So break that yes. down a little bit for us. Okay. So I'll do my best to kind of go through and give a breakdown and describe all these different things that we're hearing. <laughs> okay. So intermittent fasting or 
sometimes referred to as IF for short, is essentially a method of calorie restriction. So instead of restricting like what types of foods we're eating, um, as many diets often do, it's just restricting that time frame during which we're eating. Um, so it doesn't, you know, have any like meal plans or food lists or recipes or calorie counting or anything crazy like that. It's just simply the time frame and sometimes changing the days as well. So we'll go through some of the common forms of IF or intermittent fasting. So one of the common ones is the two day cycle. So that's a 24 hour fasting followed by a 24 hour feeding. And then this just kind of alternates back and forth. And so this eating pattern is known as alternate day fasting or every other day fasting or also every other day feeding. So it has several different names there. Okay. So <laughs> many names. So it can get really confusing. <laughs> I know. I'm like, okay, this is an added benefit of this because there's so many different ways that you can do it. But if you've right. listened to any other podcast about it, they call it something different mm-hmm. and it's kind of hard to keep up. So, And all the like little acronyms for yeah. it too. Jeez. Yes, the yeah. acronyms. So that's the first one. So it's essentially just that alternating days. So you wouldn't eat anything, and then you would eat normally on the alternating days. Got it. Another form is the 5 to 2 ratio. So it's two days out of the week or fast days, and they could be consecutive. They could be interdispersed amongst feeding days. Um, And on that fasting day, it's 25% of what you would normally eat is consumed. So you're, so you're not really fasting, fasting. You are eating, but just a quarter of what you would normally eat. Yes, exactly. exactly. So drastically less. Mm-hmm. But this okay. is something you know that might be way more amenable to specific groups of people, which is, again, I keep, I already said it like four times, but why I like that there are options. Yes. Right. So, yep. Okay. Okay. And then the remaining days, the normal feeding days, are just your 100% of your normal caloric intake. Okay. And then another one that Amy mentioned is the time-restricted eating, or it's also known as time-restricted feeding. Um, And so that is dividing the day into a period of fasting and a period of feeding. So within your 24 hours, it could be like 20 hours fasting, four hours feeding if it was pretty restrictive, or it could be, you know, 14 hours fasting, 10 hours feeding. Um, And it can just vary depending on the person and what they want to do and what works for their lifestyle. And so that's typically what people think of when they hear intermittent fasting. Yeah, that's definitely the most popular right mm-hmm. now. Okay. Definitely. People so it's like, just like, I don't eat after 7 o'clock at night, and mm-hmm. then I'll eat a little something here and then take another break, like mm-hmm. that yeah, type of exactly. Okay. So it's just, yep. you know, start at 9, and at, say, 6 or 7, and then you're not eating later in the evening or yeah. before 9. Yeah. Gotcha. And then you just eat normally throughout that time period, no, like, don't need to do anything excess or restrict anything, just your normal, typical consumption. And if you okay. think about it, it's kind of just extending what a normal fast for us, because we all fast, right? We well, sleep throughout right. the night. Mm-hmm. I mean, we hope we fast. We hope we <laughs> stay asleep and sleep well. <laughs> and so it's kind of just extending that. So I think in a way, it definitely feels like the most natural way to fast. Right. Definitely. Yeah. Following that circadian rhythm. And it mm-hmm. can help people just kind of who tend to snack later into the evening, mm-hmm. you know, if they're staying up late watching TV and things like that, and they go to the pantry, it can just kind of help eliminate that excess calories there. All right. And then the final variation we're going to discuss is to consume a very limited number of calories. So it's usually 15% to 20% of intake on the fasting days rather than. Um, taking in no calories at all because I know that can be difficult for people is to like com- not eat anything for an entire 24 hours so yeah. this is just cutting that back restricting it to that specific percentage yeah which I guess this is kind of similar to the 5-2 where you're yeah. you're cutting down to a quarter but right. again I mean just knowing that you can play with those percentages mm-hmm. you can play with the hours and I think um, a lot of people will get bogged down with like oh you know like I'm a night shift worker I can never do that and it's like oh you can really mess around with it and if your awake time hours are different you know you can you know supplement your intermittent fasting however you like right yeah which i know i was actually really thinking that maybe that type of fasting situation would kind of come naturally to night shift workers Mm -hmm. just because sometimes it's hard especially if they're shifting and i my husband used to work a night shift and now he's on days um But, like, naturally, he just wouldn't be hungry. It was hard to switch from having his, like, three days on as a Mm -hmm. nurse and then, you know, five Mm -hmm. days off or whatever Mm -hmm. and switching back and forth. So he kind of naturally did fast during that time just because it it wasn't in the regular rhythm. So, And we'll talk a little bit later about circadian rhythms, but Mm -hmm. we're kind of, like, manufactured um, to fast 
during the nocturnal evening, which means nighttime. You know, right. that we're like that's what our bodies are made up to do. And so when we uh, kind of take it just a step further and we like increase the amount of the fast that we're doing and we put a little bit of that stress on our body, it's similar. It's very similar, like the kind of stress, the physical stress that you put mm-hmm. on your body when you exercise, yep. and mm-hmm. it has this benefit at the end. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later, yeah, but but circadian rhythms play a huge role in why it, it can be beneficial. All right. And so kind of to summarize those different ver- varieties of intermittent fasting, um, you know, what we think is what draws a lot of people to this is just like the flexibility of it. It's not super restrictive. Um with cutting out foods and a really restrictive diet plan and counting macros and things like that. Um, the only restriction is the timing and there's a lot of flexibility there, you know, depending on your schedule and when you're working and, and things like that. Um, and there's also some incredibly promising results from some of these studies that they've done on intermittent fasting. So I'm going to turn it over to Amy to kind of discuss the history of intermittent fasting and get into that. So the, there's a lot there's a lot of information out there about like how intermittent fasting started, right? But really the simplest answer that we can think of is like let's think back to when we were hunters and gatherers, right? Like we definitely didn't eat um, three meals a day. Mm-hmm. I always tell all of my <laughs> right. clients, whoever made up the three meals a day is just a quack. I don't know where you got that. That's not evidence based. Mm-hmm. Um, I certainly don't eat that way. Um, anyway, so if you think back to when we were hunters and gatherers, you know, food was scarce. We didn't live in a surplus that we do now. Um, and so you can trace the history of fasting in and of itself back a really, really, really long time. Um, food wasn't always guaranteed to us and thus, you know, fasting was just kind of like a normal part of daily life. So it's been a part of our history for as long as we've been around, essentially. Um, you ate when it was available and you fasted when it was not. Uh, and you can also see fasting kind of come and go throughout history as a part of many different cultures, many different religions. Um, however, you can trace like a legitimate study done in the research, uh, back on caloric restriction without malnutrition. You'll hear us say that a few times throughout this podcast too, um, to animal models back in like the 1940s. And that's kind of when this research started. Um, but this diet really started trending and picking up around 2012 when, uh, in Australia and the UK, there was a documentary put out called eat fast and live longer by Michael Mosley. I'm sure some other people, um, might argue that, you know, okay, this person came up with it before (laughs) this person wrote this book on it before, because there's a lot of poignant figures who subscribe to, to fasting, who, you know, put it out in the universe and said, this is the new way to go X, Y, Z. Um, I think you guys heard me talk about it on the the episode that where we briefly covered it, but the Huberman podcast, put a huge Mm -hmm. Huberman lab podcast, but a huge two and a half hour long podcast on time restricted feeding. It's just a wealth of knowledge, but they do get like very, very heavy into the details. So Mm -hmm. it's a heavy, it's a heavy, Heavy it's a heavy pod. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but, uh, I think, uh, specifically this uh, documentary is really why it's it's so popular um, but like I said so many people back it so many different professionals back it which is um, pretty interesting and, and really lends itself to the program itself mm-hmm. and I was reading something just some articles about it as well and one doctor even mentioned you know like even 50 75 years ago we didn't have like television on all night and like Right. All these foods readily available, like <laughs> fast food open 24 yeah. hours. And so it's yeah. just, you know, all of these things that keep us up later and we have more access to this food, like you were saying. It's just shifted a lot. Yeah. Our external environments have changed. Drastically changed. They, <laughs> when, yeah. like, sitting at a computer. Yeah. And, like, uh, right. Well, all, all the that. package stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. like, back in the day, you really did have to make food. your food. <laughs> exactly. And that's what you ate. And you yeah. ate a lot more hot meals and that sort of thing. But now, yeah, especially when you're sitting, I mean, I find it it happens a lot. I've, I'm trying to retrain my brain right now to in my evening time when I can actually watch a show or something, not to just like snack. Oh yeah, I it's tend there. to do that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, it, it yeah. elicits like a dopamine response, it right? It is, mm-hmm. and yeah. that's something that I talk about with my clients a lot too. It's like your brain is just searching for a new sensation. Mm-hmm. Like it wants that yeah. crunch. It wants that that good taste and and when you activate a pathway so many times right like when you feed the call with food 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 it's really hard to get stimulated by something else which is also why we love our phones why we love screen time because it's that immediate gratification but if you because you know life is set up the way that it is you know you're so readily able to access that pathway right like Mm -hmm. pick up your phone pick up your Mm -hmm. phone pick up your phone like i know 
gosh, maybe like last year, I found, I found myself, you know, when we were working from home, I'd pick up my phone and like be in Instagram before I even like realized like I had a thought process about it. I'd be like, yeah. what am I doing? And you really have to retrain yourself. But yes, uh, things have changed. Time it. Yes, <laughs> things have changed. Changes. All right. So um, Gabby, tell us why like intermittent fasting, you just hear it everywhere. It's almost like like a dating profile. Like mm-hmm. what's your what's your feeding window? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so true. <you> know, <laughs> So, like, tell us, like, tell us a little bit, like, what, what is, ben- what is the benefit of eating like this? Why are so many doing, so many people doing it? Why are they willing to try it? Mm-hmm. Um, because, to be honest, when I think about it, not even just as a dietitian, but just as a human, in its most basic form, starving myself doesn't seem fun. But no. I'm a little <laughs> yeah. intrigued, right? <laughs> yeah. So we'll kind of talk about the appeal of it first. And like we've already discussed, you know, it's just this way of eating dictates the timing of the food over specifically like what kinds of food. So it really gives us freedom there, like food freedom to choose what we want to have. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, this doesn't mean to like go crazy and overindulge and just <laughs> have whatever you want during this feeding window. We want to still, you know, follow like a Mediterranean or like a nutritious whole foods based diet. Um so that we're still getting, you know, a well-rounded diet and not doing anything crazy. It's just restricting that time there. Mm -hmm. Um, And so because of that, it's a lot easier to maintain. Like, as I mentioned earlier, like diets just are so restrictive sometimes that we can't maintain them long term. And this is a lot easier to implement and kind of adjust to your needs. Um, Second positive to it, there are lots of options, as we've mentioned. Um, You know, you can incorporate it without causing lots of (laughs) upheaval in your life. Um, you can choose your eating and fasting time frames, and you can adjust based on how you react to your schedule. Let's see. You can choose to completely fast or go very low calorie. Um, yeah, so it's just a lot more flexible than, than other diets. And then an additional little note here is that the research doesn't support um, alternate day fasting where an individual would consume zero calories on one day and then double on the second day uh-huh. to make up for it. So if you're going to do that alternate day. You just want to do zero or, or low calorie the first day, and then the feeding day a normal amount. We don't need to go double or double or, or anything crazy okay. there. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And you see a lot of people who do that. They'll make up for lost time and you know have like a little renaissance with food for the mm-hmm. next day. So if you feel so compelled to do that, and we'll also call that compensor- compensatory eating. Yes. Compensatory eating. <laughs> that's a hard word. It's Essentially, hard. if you're compensating, um, yeah, that's. Uh, it kind of like, you know, increased longevity and, you know, different lab values and disease markers. We don't really see that being affected if, if you're doubling up on your exactly. calories. Yeah. 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 So now we'll get into some of the benefits. I'll let Amy take over and dive into that. All righty. Okay. Um, so something that I did mention in the, the previous podcast is that a lot of the research that is being done or that has been done and completed is on animal models. Now, this is because um, – and, and what you see is an increase in lifespan, mm-hmm. so longevity, uh, a decrease in mortality. So these are kind of constant themes that you see in the research. Um, this hasn't been replicated in human studies, and that's because right. humans tend to live longer than rats and mice, uh, which is, you <laughs> yeah, know, preferred. Yeah. <laughs> um, but – Uh, Kind of the takeaway with all of the research that I'll talk to you about is we need more. Um, We need Mm -hmm. more significant studies and we need more human studies. But you'll kind of see if you read any of the research that the researchers themselves also agree that that is there. Um, But that's one of the biggest things. So increased longevity. Um, And I hear a lot of people making the argument that, you know, okay, well, when we were hunters and gatherers, you know, lifespan was significantly lower. We only lived until we were right. like 26. <laughs> um, well, there's disease. Yes. Touche. Yes. <laughs> Touche. You are of correct. Yeah. Factors there. Um, and so to that, I'll say I wish the only variable um, at stake here was diet. Uh, uh, because, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. we were more prone to like animal attacks and accidents, disease, et cetera. And environment. And, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Way more threats, different kinds of threats mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. than what we experience now. Um, so, you know, in summary, just keep your mind open. Open, but you know, at the end of all of this, more research needed. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that's kind of the the pattern of nutrition research in general. Nutrition is a really baby science when you look at all the other sciences, and so it's not 
um, to invalidate the research itself or invalidate the profession of nutrition itself. It's just that it's constantly changing and it's a baby. Right. Um, so don't be surprised if we come out and knock it in about five years. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So some other benefits of intermittent fasting are improved biomarkers of disease, reduced oxidative stress, and preserved learning and memory function. So essentially, um, broken down into some simpler terms, uh, we see less incidence of disease or less markers that would predict that disease. Mm-hmm. Reduce stress on the body. Um, oxidative stress are one of those things that, um, you know, like cancer causing agents in the body, things like that. Oxidative stress cause cancer. Um, <clears throat> and then healthier brain function. So better cognition, better memory. Love those things. Um, so again, because most research has been conducted on animals, most experts are now calling for well controlled human studies in people across a range of body mass indexes or mm-hmm. sizes. Yeah. So we can appreciate this. Um, A lot of people will make the argument as well that undernourishment or chronic undernourishment can cause stress to the body. And so kind of like what I said previously, we're looking for caloric restriction that doesn't result in malnutrition. So it's a subtle restriction Mm -hmm. over time. Um, And that's what you see kind of like what I was mentioning to you, Candy, earlier is um, that physical stress that it puts on the body is actually really beneficial in the same way that exercise and that Mm -hmm. physical stress that that causes is really good for our cardiovascular system and, you know, building lean body mass and things like that. Um, So the caveat there is we need to give our bodies adequate time to recover from stress. And so to acknowledge your feeding window, um, eat nutritionally dense foods. And that's not to say, you know, that you have to go like, you know, keto or something while you're in your feeding window. Some people do. Um, but making sure that, you know, like Gabby said, a Mediterranean diet, you're getting your fruits and veggies, mm-hmm. you're getting your, your healthy meats and uh, proteins and whatnot, um, and allowing your body to recover. All right. So some other benefits. So when we stay in a fasted state from anywhere from 10 to 16 hours, our bodies start to produce ketones. And ketones are uh, made from fat molecules. They're energy molecules made from fat um, that have a ton of benefits in the research if you look at it. Now, I don't want to get too, like, researchy and, you know, all that stuff because that only appeals to a certain crowd. Um, But what we see in the research is that when you release these ketones into the blood, um, you have that, like, beneficial, like, better adaptability and learning and memory functioning. So that, like, brain processing really um, enhances. And so that's another benefit. Um, We also see... Ultimately, with this time-restricted feeding, you see caloric restriction without um, that compensatory eating. Again, you're not making up for lost time and doubling your calories. But ultimately, this results in weight loss. Mm -hmm. So um, I think initially this type of eating was acknowledged for its really great results in weight loss, and that would be why. So Mm -hmm. if that's a goal of yours, something that you're looking for, this might be the thing for you. Um, Okay, so there's also a growing amount of evidence that eating according to our circadian rhythm or our 24-hour cycles, and I hope you guys can stick with me on this because this can kind of get a little (laughs) bit, like, detailed, Um, but essentially um, eating during your nocturnal phases of your 24-hour cycle, we have, you know, the nighttime phase and the light light or daytime phase, um, can actually be really detrimental to our health. So... All of the genes that we express on a daily basis in our body, 80% of them are dictated by night and day. So that, what does that mean, dictated? Um, so you, essentially you express at a, at a high rate or you express at a low rate these genes depending on the timing of the day. And if you right. eat according to the timing of the day, which that could really take up like a year's worth of podcasts. We could get into <laughs> So I'm really just giving you like – the bare minimum here. Um, But when you're eating during the light phases, during the daytime, you're actually really enhancing your health and your well-being. And so if you hear anybody saying eating on a 24-hour cycle, eating according to your circadian rhythm, it's essentially just eating during the daytime. Um, And you can imagine this gets kind of wonky with people who live in like different parts. (laughs) Yes. Um, And people who do shift Shift work. work. And, you know, it can get quite complicated. And um, but, you know, for standard, I don't want to say normal, but quote unquote normal people Mm -hmm. who, you know, have like 12 hours on, 12 hours off. It's it's more appropriate to eat during um, the physical light day. 
Right. Um, so many other benefits in the research to time-restricted eating or, or intermittent fasting, but um, these are the ones that I really, really wanted to highlight. I do encourage, you know, if, if you're if you're kind of like a research buff and you want to get out there and, and listen or read or pay attention, you know, whatever, you know, read, read stuff because it's coming out left and right. It's mm-hmm. almost, it's almost overwhelming. You know, you can't keep up with it. Um, Sasha and Panda is a, a really well-known researcher and has put like tons of papers out there, tons of really great, um, uh, articles. And so if you see the name S Panda in any of the articles, okay. know that it's golden. That's an easy one to remember. <laughs> I <too>. know. <laughs> yeah. Panda. S Panda. That's fun. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So... Intermittent fasting sounds pretty awesome, doesn't it? Maybe almost too good to be true. Is this really the best um, eating plan or diet for everyone? Maybe not. Um, And what are some possible side effects? So I'm going to talk about maybe who should be a little more wary or who should um, consult, you know, be extra careful there. Consult with their their provider before um, looking or, you know, implementing this into their life. So to start... Pregnant or breastfeeding individuals, um, you know, it's just not the best to do like a caloric restriction during that time. You have, a, you know, increased caloric needs and the baby's developing and especially with breastfeeding. So we just don't want to restrict their do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we want to honor the body's needs and, and follow what, what the body needs at that time. Um, additionally, anyone that's trying to conceive or experiencing problems with fertility And then those who have a history of eating disorders, it may not be the best thing just because, you know, with a lot of eating disorders, there's a lot of restriction there and control. Mm -hmm. And so this could, you know, not be the best for anyone with a history of that or recovered from from the eating disorders. And then, you know, children and teens under 18, we don't want to, you know, contribute to possibly a development of an eating disorder or restrict them in any ways. We want to let them, you know, honor their hunger cues and and learn about foods and, and not feel restricted. Um, and then those individuals with, you know, any blood sugar disorders, diabetes, or underlying health conditions as, you know, prolonged um, periods without food can cause low blood sugar. And that could be a, an issue for some of those individuals mm-hmm. there. Yeah. So, you know, as we've mentioned prior, for many of these reasons um, and others, it's just really important to talk with your health care provider and a dietitian before, you know, making any drastic changes or implementing this. Awesome. Um, So what if you go to your provider and you're like, hey, doc, hey, registered dietitian, I want to try this. I've heard a lot. I listen to the St. Alphonsus Wellcast. (laughs) Um, Of course. (laughs) And they clear you and they say, yeah, let's let's get started. And and you figure out you've got an eating window, you've got a fasting window. Um, What are some potential things to look out for? What can happen? Um, We just want to give you guys the information. um, And so this is in no way trying to be negative, but this is, you know, potentially what could happen. This way of eating essentially means kind of going against your intuition, right? Now, paying attention to hunger and fullness cues is something as a society we all struggle to do Mm -hmm. because we don't prioritize feelings of hunger. We don't prioritize feelings of fullness. And um, so this is something that we're kind of already out of touch with. But speaking specifically to IF, intermittent fasting, this is kind of purposefully going to throw you into ignoring hunger or you might even feel in your eating window, you know, like, oh, I need to eat now. I need to meet my calorie goal because I don't have much time. Mm -hmm. And so you might (laughs) fill up a little bit. And while we're definitely not saying that either way is the right way to go, um, it does mean overriding feelings of hunger. And if you are, you know, someone who has really tapped into eating and really have allowed yourself to only be driven to eat by internal cues only, this can feel really unnatural. um, And you might find that IF could be really frustrating um, due to having to break those natural hunger and fullness cues to fit into your eating window, so to Mm -hmm. speak. Um, You will likely experience hunger if you try this. (laughs) Uh, So even if your eight hour, even if your fast is 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 eight hours or or you know even shorter than that, um, if it's not if you're not accustomed to stopping food for that long, um, you can get you know the hunger pains. Um, And so going to bed hungry might be something that happens to you, and it might be unsustainable. It might be something that you really just can't adapt to. Um, If you plan on trying being fasting, the the main thing here is just you can bank on feeling hungry, especially in the beginning parts. And I think a lot of people will, you know, encourage you to stick it out and say that you'll adjust, and and we definitely see that. Um, But just to know... It's a it's a good idea to just be aware of that and and know what you're getting into and um, you know when you decide if this is something that is suitable for you or not. Uh, the side effects can alter your mood. So I've just got one word, 
Hangry. Hangry. <laughs> hangry. Oh, I get so hangry. I know this guys. word well. <laughs> right. Me too. <laughs> I mean, irritability and anxiety are classic symptoms of low blood sugar. Um, and so just being aware, you know, that if, if, you know, you're not clocked in to start eating for a couple hours and you're already getting your hunger pains, man, those – those hangry pains are coming too. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, fortunately they're just kind of normal as you as you adjust. But again, you know, knowing when it, if it's not suitable, if this is not doable. Right. Like, again, if you're prone to low blood sugar or if you're prone mm-hmm. to any of these other things or if you just simply don't like it, you don't have to do it. <laughs> right. Um, besides all of these things, um, besides, you know, initially increasing hunger levels, fasting can also cause things like headaches, constipation, fatigue, disturbances in your sleep, and a couple other things. So it's just important to know the signs, you know, know what to look out for, keep vigilant, and be very aware of your body because that those are signs that this is potentially something that won't work with you and something that you definitely want to bring to your provider or your dietitian and, and talk about as a, um, you know, an important discussion of whether or not to keep going um, or to stop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we'll quickly review some of the main takeaways from our podcast today. So as we've mentioned quite a few times, <laughs> just <laughs> don't this. forget to <laughs> consult your provider and a dietitian before even like not even intermittent fasting before changing anything with your diet. Mm-hmm. We're here to help you. We have a wealth of knowledge um, and we want to work with you to, you know, make healthful changes. Secondly, you know, figure out a plan that works for you um, and that will work with your schedule. You know, personally, I know like going 24 hours without food, I'm going to be very irritable, hangry. I'll probably have headaches. Like I know that's not going to work for me, you know? So everybody (laughs) is kind of different. Some people can do that. I know that that wouldn't work for me. And so that's what's great about this is, you know, we can kind of cater it to our needs and, you know, everyone knows their own body the best. So you'll know what works best for you Mm -hmm. there. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, Amy, you want to finish up with the final two? Yeah, and then I also just want to say, you know, um, our bodies really love routine, Mm -hmm. and you can really, like, attribute that to to so much of your life, a sleep routine, a work routine. um, You know, your body loves to know what to expect. And so oftentimes, if you're picking an intermittent fasting routine that is just not suitable for you, either, you know, you you can only catch a couple Zs during a – you know, a time that you've set to feed, like, and it's not going to work, what's going to happen? The consequence is, is constantly disrupting or disturbing your fasting and feeding windows and changing that actually can kind of just be counterproductive to the, um, benefits that we see in the research. So consistency routine Mm -hmm. is key. So that's why it's important. Um, yeah, to just, you know, uh, feel it out and try Mm -hmm. to do something that's suitable, which might mean not going for a crazy 16 hour fast Mm -hmm. and eight hour feeding window. Maybe you need a 10 hour feeding window maybe right. you need a 12 hour feeding window right. um and so just making sure that you are acknowledging what you can and can't do mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and knowing that you have flexibility um another thing to keep in mind um it's important to eat a well-balanced diet without that compensatory eating uh you know whole 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 foods based mediterranean diet whatever you like and that's not to say that you need to be restrictive you know that's not to say you can't have cake at the birthday party mm-hmm. or that you can't enjoy a soda every once in a while because again that's one of the benefits of this diet is that right. it doesn't tell you what you can't have and it's not restrictive in that way but if you are eating a well balanced nutritious diet you're going to reap the benefits mm-hmm. just you know that much more significantly right. and greatly exactly um, and then the last thing we just want to say is is pay attention to your body. You know, is your body showing you signs that this isn't working or is maybe it's working to your detriment? It's not really helping you. It's not really healthy. Um, doesn't mean that, you know, you're a failure or, or anything. It just means that this particular way of, of eating, this lifestyle that I would rather call it, is just not for you. And that's mm-hmm. okay because we are all diverse. Our bodies look different. Our bodies are different on the inside and they react differently. Um, so with that, any last comments? That wraps it up. I found it very informative. This is really great. I mean, I think, you know, like you said, that this is going around. This is pretty popular. Mm -hmm. It's kind of buzzy right now. So it's nice to just have an overview over the different types and understanding some of those pros and some of those cons Mm -hmm. and knowing that whatever, if you do decide after talking to your provider (laughs) to do this, 
to pick one. There's flexibility in mm-hmm, it, but mm-hmm. try to pick one and then kind of stick with that for a while yes. so that you're not seeing those potential detriments. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, make an assessment and see if it's right for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just say again, um, if you guys, you know, are the nerds like me um, and you are interested in the science and you want to learn about the metabolic pathways and you want to learn about the different genes that are expressed when you do participate in intermittent fasting, and yes, it does get that detailed. Mm-hmm. The Huberman <laughs> Lab podcast it is fantastic. It's two and a half hours of just science, and we love it. Um, not necessarily for our podcast here, but um, and then there's tons of research out there. So just go, you know, do a Google Scholar search and and um, and find some some. You'll you will find some fascinating stuff. Yeah, definitely. All right. right. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening, and we will catch you later on the Saint Alphonsus Wellcast. Thank you for listening to this episode of Saint Alphonsus Wellcast. Brought to you by St. Alphonsus Corporate Health and Wellbeing and the St. Alphonsus Foundation. Always be sure to catch new episodes by subscribing to us through all major podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. We hope you'll tune in again. Until then, be well.